Hey everyone, today we're going to be talking about the Nintendo Switch and the Wii U. Specifically, why the Wii U failed and how Nintendo has learned from the mistakes of the Wii U to make the Switch so far a resounding success and to make the Switch better set up for future success post-launch. Now, to understand this, we have to admit that the Wii U first was a failure. It really was. It failed, it flopped in so many different avenues that it's interesting to see that some people don't grasp why the Wii U was a failure. And I say this because the whole reason I'm talking about this topic is because a guy named Alex from our Facebook page, and I'll put a link down in the description below to our Facebook page, uh, got a little perturbed on a a little news post that we put up about Nintendo spent more money on advertising in March than anyone else in the game industry. And essentially, it just means that Nintendo spent a ton of money on advertising for the Nintendo Switch during its launch month. And Alex responded to that by saying, I don't see why. People who buy Nintendo are pretty loyal, and they already know what kind of experience to expect. So they will always buy Nintendo. They just gotta say what makes the system different from the last one, and they could do it on Facebook. Plus, with all the people who think they need to make YouTube channels and everything out there, they got their free advertisement right there. <laughs> oh, oh, Alex. Uh, the, it didn't stop there, but just to address a, a couple points that he brings up. Um, put, uh, putting a post on Facebook is not necessarily a great way to advertise. Yes, they have a few million followers on Facebook. Uh in fact, they've almost sold as many Switch units already as they have Facebook followers. And Facebook's organic reach as someone who, I don't know if I call myself a Facebook expert, but I did build up a page from nothing to 840,000 likes and Nintendo Prime in a few short months from nothing to 55,000 likes. Um, Facebook is very poor for advertising unless you pay to have your ads uh, seen by more people. And even then, with all the little ways that Facebook lets you control your demographics, it doesn't guarantee that any sales come out of those come out of those ads. So a post on Facebook isn't really, uh, I mean, it should be done, but it's not, you shouldn't just stop there. That's not gonna make your system sell. Um, I mean, in fact, in that case, why even do Nintendo Directs at all? Why even have a YouTube channel? Um, and then about all the YouTube channels willing to advertise everything for free, uh, Nintendo has massive restrictions on YouTube channels, including our own. Uh, the reason, you know, in this video right here, you're seeing footage of Puyo Puyo Tetris. Or Puyo Puyo, yeah, Puyo Puyo Tetris. And that game is made by Sega. It does not get claimed on YouTube. Uh, it's a fantastic little game. Uh, I'm playing it on Nintendo Switch. I have a link down in the description if you would like to purchase the game. Uh, I really suggest you do. It's a lot of fun. But... The idea here is that if I use Breath of the Wild footage, I would have to wait four days for my video to be approved by Nintendo to put ads on it. Otherwise, Nintendo's gonna, either going to put ads on it themselves and take all the money from it, or Nintendo would block my video. And the thing is, when I go to get approved, if they don't like what I'm saying in the video, Nintendo can deny me anyways. So there's a lot of uh, political play here with Nintendo compared to other companies. So again, YouTube channels doing everything for free isn't necessarily true. Um, you, you do have channels like Game Explain that do have uh, partners that try to block Nintendo from being able to affect their channel. But again, if Nintendo really, really wanted to, they could do an, a full strike against Game Explain, and that would affect the entire network. Um, it hasn't happened yet. I don't see Nintendo doing that, but Nintendo has the power. YouTube and Facebook aren't necessarily guaranteed ways to advertise especially a brand new console. So again, I think a lot of you out there will agree how ridiculous that statement was. Um, but someone responded, you know, that because a company wants to attract new customers, that's why bad advertisement is one of the reasons why the Wii U failed. Um, and then Alex responded with the Wii U failed because of the type of people that are out there nowadays that are too lazy to understand the capabilities of hardware and software. The Wii U has the biggest library of games available over any console. It has CFW, whatever that means, on both sides, and old, countless homebrew apps and emulators. People are lazy nowadays, that's all there is to it. As for attracting new people, those are the ones that make the experience not fun at all because everyone seems to feel they have this sense of entitlement and complain about every last thing like complaining like a five-year-old girl is suddenly cool. Those are the ones that complain about graphics and FPS. Those are not the things Nintendo is about, but yet these people can't seem to understand that the systems they have, the ones they like to suck their dicks with, 
by the way. Not his words, not mine. Don't have shit for frame rate and graphics. Also, because if they knew anything, they would know it's always held by PC gaming. And you can never beat that. Um, he goes on to say a few more things. Um, you know, like he's about to turn 30. So, you know, he, he's been gaming a while. He has a daughter, yada, 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 yada. Uh, but in general, it's interesting seeing this viewpoint still in today's world about why the Wii U failed. Essentially, the Wii U failed. He's blaming consumers for why the Wii U failed. <laughs> um, and not Nintendo. See, the Wii U failed because Nintendo created a system that even they themselves didn't want to take advantage of. Let me explain. So, Nintendo released a system with, that was heavily built on this idea of asymmetric gaming, right? They put, have one person with a gamepad, everyone else with different controllers. The person with the gamepad can do different things and affect the other people with the controllers. Uh, in Nintendo Land, you had the Chase Me. That was an example of asymmetric play. Uh, in, uh, I think it was uh, New Super Mario Brothers uh, for Wii U. New Super Mario Brothers U, as it was officially called. Uh the person with the gamepad could add little platforms, which you don't really need. But anyways, he could. it was a way to affect the world. Uh, the reality is that probably the best use of it would have been like a Dungeons & Dragons kind of thing, where a dungeon master has the gamepad and can control various elements of the game. That kind of game never came out to exist. Um, other ways the gamepad was obviously used for things like inventory management. But, you know, as I played Breath of the Wild, I started realizing that the inventory management in Breath of the Wild really isn't any less intuitive than the gamepad. If I have to take my eyes off the screen to manage my inventory anyways, what's the difference with hitting a pause menu and then selecting what I want and then going back into the game? There's, there's not really a whole lot of difference. And Nintendo kind of realized that over time, and most of their games do not take advantage of any of the unique features of the gamepad. And the ones that do, say uh, Splatoon, which I, I think it had a really cool feature about tapping the screen to do your super jumps. Well, now that we've seen Splatoon 2 out in the wild and we've had beta testing for it with their servers online, we see that how they replaced it works almost just as well as it did tapping the screen. So there really isn't um, any functionality that the, the screen added that really seemed to improve games. Uh, the exception to this is, oddly enough, not a Nintendo game. Zombie U by Ubisoft actually made the gamepad make sense. Um, it added suspense and horror to the game that uh, would not be there otherwise. And when they ported the game to the other systems, that's why the Wii U version is still the superior version because it was not the same. Over, like Overlays on the screen is not the same as what the game was originally built for. So again, one game did it really, really well, and it's a game Nintendo didn't even make. So Nintendo had this idea with the Wii U gamepad that they themselves never really fulfilled, right? That That's kind of the core concept here, is that... The whole concept of the Wii U did not connect with Nintendo's own developers. So that's that's problem number one. Problem number two is that Nintendo chose a terrible name. If you look at the logo of the Wii U, it literally just looks like a, an add-on. It, it does. And then you combine that with all their advertising. All their advertising has the console in the background. You have the giant screen in the foreground. So... What happens is people see that, they see the, the little console in the back, and they think, oh, Wii U, that little console in the back is just a new modified Wii. It, it, it's just, you know, just like the Wii Mini. And the thing in the front is the add-on. That's the Wii U. That's your $300 add-on. Uh, and that didn't look enticing. Uh, the gamepad itself, the screen, was capacitive and really crappy. It was, it was very, very low quality. Um, I know that I enjoyed my time with the Wii U, so I'm, I'm not sitting here to bash Wii, but I'm explaining why I failed. So the screen was really low quality. Uh, they added a TV button on, onto the physical controller, but their Nintendo TV app never really was that good. So they weren't even fully dedicated to that. Uh, they didn't deliver in a way that I think people thought they should with the innovations. They released a console that, yes, it wasn't all about the graphics, it wasn't all about the power, it was Nintendo's first HD console, and it had a lot of fantastic games. You know, Mario Kart 8, you know, again, there's a reason they re-released re it, um, because it was a fantastic game in the first place. So, they failed in a lot of avenues with the Wii U. And to say that it's because consumers are too lazy to understand the capabilities of the hardware and software, Nintendo was too lazy then to understand the capabilities of their own hardware because they failed to do anything fun and unique with the hardware that struck a chord with gamers. They failed to tell people or explain to people with a game that 
this gamepad is needed, that this gamepad um, excels at what it's meant to do, that the gamepad is essential, it's a new evolution. Nintendo didn't do anything to enforce that, which is why a lot of people prefer just playing the game with a pro controller. Uh, now, in many ways, the Wii U's failures are the Nintendo Switch's successes. Uh, so the Switch might not have, like, you know, the greatest console name of all time, but it has a console name that makes sense. When you hear a Nintendo Switch, you don't think about a Wii U. Even though it's got motion controls, you don't think about a Wii U. You think about a brand new product. You think, oh, why is it called Switch? Because it switches from handheld to TV. That makes sense. The Wii U's prospect didn't make sense at a consumer level. One of the greatest features of the Wii U was, was probably off TV play. And um, you're tethered to your console. You're using a low quality screen that washes out the colors. Uh, your controller looks like a kid's toy. I mean, now that the Switch is out, if you look back at that Wii U gamepad, it looks like a Fisher Price toy. Uh, it was just not very appealing. So again, these are not issues with consumers. This is issues with the Wii U's design, marketing, name, and Nintendo's failure to prove the concept of the Wii U. Anyways, so the Switch has an understandable name. The Switch has an appealing design. It looks like a high-quality tablet. When you, Nintendo released the tablet screen for Wii U, it instantly looked like something that was 10 years old. And the new screen, despite being 720p and being a plastic screen instead of Gorilla Glass in terms of the covering of the LCD, is still a pretty high-quality screen. People touch it, they feel it, it looks good, it looks like today's technology. Uh, the innovation of removing the Joy-Cons and sliding them back on makes sense. There's nothing confusing about it. And it makes sense in terms of how you would play, like, oh... You're, you plop it down and you want to play two-player Mario Kart. You slide off the controls, you turn them sideways, and because of the Wii era, we now know that sideways you do motion control driving and it just works. So everything about the Switch makes sense, and Nintendo has been already taken advantage of it because the main idea here is the main idea of the Switch isn't even removing the two, two Joy-Cons and everything. The main idea is that you could play the system on, go, on the go and on the TV. It's a very easy to understand concept. You don't need a game tailored for Switch to understand that. As an example, Breath of the Wild, the number one selling game on Nintendo Switch, is a traditional console game originally built for Wii U. However, its mass appeal on the Switch is extremely obvious because it plays to what the Switch is most capable of doing, and that's providing a AAA gaming experience on your TV and on the go. And that's something that is easily conveyed by just playing games. Uh, the Wii U, you play it, it almost feels like you're fighting against the system to get your full enjoyment out of it, and, and that sucks. It, it really does. So, again, the Wii U failed for a copious amount of reasons, probably even more than I already stated. But the Switch is instantly appealing. Um, to give you an idea, I used to bring my Wii U into an elementary school that I work at. And the kids would play it. They thought it was cool. They thought Splatoon and Mario Kart. Like, I think those games are fun. But they also thought it was clunky. And I never heard any of those kids when they were done saying, yeah, that was fun, but I, now I want one. I'm going to go tell my, my parents I want a Wii U. I brought in my Switch now every single day since launch to work at this elementary school. And the kids can't get enough of it. They've been asking their parents for the Switch. They want a Switch. Um... Switch is cool. It's seen as hip. It makes sense to them. Uh, it's appealing to them. Not just the games, the system itself is appealing. And that's what the Wii U struggled with. As You could have all the fantastic games you want in the world. It could have had a Breath of the Wild at launch as an example. But Wii U itself was unappealing. And that's where the Switch is succeeding. That's why you're seeing the sales you're seeing. I know people are like, oh, it's just because of Zelda. No, people who bought the Switch for Zelda admit they like the Switch itself. Um, how many, you know, over half of the consumers, if not 80% of the consumers by now who bought a Switch, also bought Mario Kart 8 Deluxe. See, it's not just a Zelda system. When games come out, they're continuing to buy them. Okay? I mean... From in March alone, there was over 5 million pieces of software sold. That means that everyone who bought a Switch also bought one other game besides Zelda. That's insane. So if you just look at the grand scope, 
The Wii U failed because it was an idea that Nintendo didn't really believe in. And the Switch is succeeding because it's an idea Nintendo does believe in. And it's an idea that learned off the marketing of the Wii U. The Nintendo Switch is what the Wii U really should have been in the first place. But it wasn't. Now we have a product that even isn't even complete. We don't even have the online systems for it and people still enjoy it. They're still taking it with them on planes while hooking it up to their TV, while taking it on trains and buses. And as an example, when I'm at work, we don't hook it up to a TV at work, so we actually use tabletop mode a lot. And it's surprisingly useful. We were playing four-player Mario Kart 8 Deluxe yesterday on a table on that dinky screen. And I know some people say, oh, that wouldn't be comfortable. It worked just fine. It really wasn't that bad. So Nintendo's on to something with the Switch, something that they weren't onto with the Wii U. Uh, and... Reality is the Switch is extremely easy to understand, makes sense, and looks appealing, and they're going to spend a lot of marketing for it because they realized ever since they unveiled this thing back in October that there is a huge market of people that are being like, man, this looks good. And sorry, it's not just Nintendo faithful Alex and other people who believe this that buy Nintendo systems. Uh, a lot of people that they're attracting with the Switch right now are people that did not buy a Wii U, did not even buy a Wii. They are attracting adults that are lapsed video gamers that want a system that's more convenient to their lifestyle. And the Switch provides you that at-home and on-the-go experience in such a seamless way that there's no compromises. At least, it doesn't feel like there's any compromises. I mean, yeah, 1080p to 720p, but on that small of a screen, you don't notice much of a difference. Anyways, this is Nathaniel Ruffle Jans from Nintendo Prime, signing out.